Okay, in this section, we'll just consider how to do some statistical inference on survival curves, how to actually incorporate sampling variability into the story. And because the survival curve is multidimensional, it's a function of both time and a percentage, it's no longer a single number. So we deal with it slightly differently. The estimated survival curve, S hat of t, is just an estimate based on a sample from a larger population. How do we quantify uncertainty on a curve? Well, one approach is we can put confidence intervals around each change in the curve estimated at each event time. These are just proportions, and we can actually slap confidence intervals on them. And there's a method for doing that, which is similar to the method we did for single proportions. But this can be cumbersome to read and interpret when there are many event times, and we'll see an example of this coming up. It's also not a very efficient approach for comparing the survival curves between multiple populations based on multiple random samples. You have to compare multiple confidence intervals and see if they overlap at different portions of the curve, and there's no easy way to do that. So we're going to talk about a more unified approach. There are some common statistical tests which compare the curves as a whole which at least incorporate all the information at once and allow us to make a decision about whether the curves are different, statistically speaking, at the population level or not. And the two we're going to focus on, the two most common ones you'll see in the literature, they're doing the same thing just slightly differently. One is called the generalized Wilcoxon test, sometimes also called the Breslow or Guillen tests. So you'll see it referred to any permutation of those names. The other one that you'll see very often is called the log rank test. And both compare the two survival curves across multiple time points to ultimately answer the question, is the overall underlying time to event experience different between the two groups or not? So just like any other hypothesis test we've done, there's a null and alternative hypothesis. The null is that the true underlying curves in the two groups being compared are equivalent. The alternative is that they're not. The Wilcoxon test is more sensitive to early differences in the follow-up period, i.e. if the curves diverge earlier rather than later, Wilcoxon will be more in tune to that. And the log rank is more sensitive to later survival differences. But basically what both do is they compute a difference between what is observed at each event time and what would be expected under the null. So it's the same idea of comparing what we see to what we'd expect under the null, and measuring the discrepancy. And that's what we, how we've approached all hypothesis testing situations. So it measures these discrepancies, but it measures them at every single event time in each of the two groups can compare it. And then it aggregates these differences across all event times into one overall distance measure, one uber measure, how far the sample curves differ from the null, what would be expected under the null, accounting for sampling variability. So basically how far our result is compared to what we'd expect to see under the null taking sampling variability into account. So just a more complicated measure of discrepancy since it's being aggregated across multiple points. And the Wilcox and the log rank test, they aggregate these event time specific differences slightly differently. That's the difference in approach. One weights those earlier more heavily and one weights them those later in the time period more heavily. But both tests give a p-value, and generally these p-values are relatively similar. The shortcomings of these tests, and why we're going to hold off until giving you the big guns in stat reasoning too, is that neither gives an overall measure of association, like a relative risk or a risk difference or difference in means. And as such, it cannot give a confidence interval for the measure of association it does not give. So there's no quantification here, just we get a p-value. So let's look at some examples of these in action. This is sort of an interesting study, which is sort of outside the realm of what we looked at before, but certainly does have a role in public health. And it was an actual study done in aviation science, but it's, it makes for an interesting case study. And it's time to motion sickness. And this was actually a simulation done with volunteers designed to measure the impact of the intensity of prolonged vertical motion exposure on motion sickness. And two groups were randomized to be put into a simulator and receive a dose, if you will, of low vertical motion for up to two hours. So they were basically put into an aircraft simulator and exposed to these vibrations, simulating low vertical motion for up to two hours. 
in the second group, they were subjected to high vertical motion for up to two hours. And the event, the <laughs> measurable outcome here is actually vomiting. <laughs> so their first vomiting episode would be considered the event of interest, and that would signify motion sickness. So some people made it all the way to the end of the two-hour period without vomiting and hence were censored at two hours. Some people actually dropped out prior to the end of the period without actually vomiting, but because they felt like they couldn't take it or something. So they were censored somewhere between the beginning and the end of the two-hour period. So here are the Kaplan-Meier curves for time to motion sickness in each group. And just to show you that putting 95% confidence intervals on the curve makes it hard to see what's going on, this one has the 95% confidence intervals. It's not a very efficient way I think you'll get the picture of comparing curves because it's really hard to get the gestalt, the big picture. One thing you might want to note, though, and it's hard to see, but the confidence intervals actually do get wider with increased time. And think about why that is. This is just a side note. Well, we're losing information as time goes on because essentially our sample size is getting smaller and smaller of people who are eligible to have the event, our number of persons at risk. And so the proportions are based on lesser information, which leads to greater uncertainty. So this curve, Kaplan-Meier, tracks the proportion of persons who had still not vomited at a given time point. And you can see, as expected, this is higher curve in the low vertical motion group than the high vertical motion group. So those in the low vertical motion group can hold out longer, basically. That's what these curves say. And here's the same picture, and we just stripped it of the confidence interval so you can get a clearer picture. But the question is, there's not a lot of information going into this to start, and then, of course, we lose people to vomit and hear censoring as time goes on. So just because we see a difference in the curves based on our sample, is it real after we count for... You know, random sampling variability. Had we done randomized people a different way, would we get very different results or would we get something consistent that showed the dominance of a low vertical motion group in terms of staving off vomiting? So we could set this up in a hypothesis testing framework and use the tests I talked about before to get a p-value. So the null here would be that the survival experience of the two groups were equivalent, that the time to vomiting the percentage of people who remain event-free over time is the same in both groups at the process or population level versus the alternative that it's not. I'm not going to go into how to do this. I, I include some bonus material if you wanted to set this up and stay and do it yourself. But the p-value by both tests that we discussed are very similar, 0.073 and 0.075. So statistically speaking, there's no difference if you use the 0.05 cutoff as your rejection level, this is not a statistically significant difference. Even though the study showed some evidence that higher vertical motion was more linked to earlier vomiting or motion sickness, after accounting for sampling variability, we can't rule out the possibility that there's no association between the intensity of the vertical motion and motion sickness. So let me ask you this. If you saw these results and the claim was made that the difference was not statistically significant, but you saw those Kaplan-Meier curves, and you were offered the opportunity to fly in a plane that either was subjected to high or low vertical motion, what would you choose? Here's another example. It's a famous clinical trial conducted between January 1974 and 1984, a double-blinded randomized trial on patients with primary biliary cirrhosis. We'll call it PBC from here on in a disease of the liver, and this was conducted at the Mayo Clinic, the famous Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota in the United States. Much larger study than the previous one. A total of 312 patients were randomized to either a drug group, DPCA, 154 people, or placebo, the other 158. And, and patients were followed until they died from PVC or until censoring, either administrative censoring, they were withdrawn alive at the end of the study, that sounds very visceral, but it just it's a good thing. It means at the end of the study, they were still alive, or death not attributable to PBC. So somebody died, for example, in a car accident. They were censored because they were taken from life for another reason other than PBC. If they got a liver transplantation or if they were lost to follow up. Here are the Kaplan-Meier curves for time to motion sickness for each group with the 95% CIs at each event time. And you can see that's putting the confidence intervals on this graph is almost absurd because there's so many 
event times between the two groups because there's 312 people total that you can't make heads or tails of what's going on with those confidence intervals. So that, again, it's not a very efficient way to account for r random sampling variability in the curves. Here are the curves without the 95% confidence intervals. So you can see here now they sort of interweave and it looks like the drug group's doing slightly better. Remember, the event is death, so we're tracking the proportion who are still alive. So being higher is better. Still, they sort of interweave and go back and forth, but there's no clear visual evidence of one group being dominant to the other. But if we actually wanted to put this into a hypothesis testing framework, the null hypothesis would be that the drug and placebo groups have the same time to death experience at the population level. If we were to give every patient with primary ability cirrhosis one or the other, what would happen? Versus the alternative that they're different. If you look at the log rank results, the p-value is 0.75 and the Breslin, Wilcox, and Geo is a lot larger at 0.96, but neither one of them is statistically significant by a landslide if we use 0.05 as our cutoff. The reason I think that the log rank is slightly lower is that it is picking up. If you go back to that Kaplan-Meier, you can see that towards the end of the time period, the curves diverge the most, and it's a little more sensitive to those later in the time period differences. But nevertheless, there's no evidence based on this data of the efficacy or superiority of DPCA in preventing death or prolonging life for patients with primary biliary cirrhosis. Let's look at some examples straight out of the literature as well. This is an interesting study. The obstructive sleep apnea is a risk factor for stroke and death. So subjects were followed until death or stroke, the events of interest, or censoring. And here are some words about the study provided by the authors, taken verbatim from the article. They define what constitutes sleep apnea and how they classify people as either suffering from it or not. And then they say the Kaplan-Meier method and log rank test were used to compare event-free survival among patients with and those without the obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. So people who remain death and stroke free. And here's the Kaplan-Meier plot they published in the article. So you can see that, remember, this is tracking now the probability of survival in the sample, the portion who remained stroke and death free, and that those that controls the people without sleep apnea tended to do better than those with sleep apnea in the follow-up period, the six-year follow-up period. And notice they actually, on the graph here, down towards the origin, it says P equals 0 0.02, and that's testing you know, this is an estimate. These are both estimates from smaller samples from a larger population. That's testing the null that the survival experience time to events, death or stroke, is the same for people with apnea and without, and that suggests rejecting the null at the 0.05 level. So they found a statistically significant difference in which those with apnea had worse prognosis than those without. Here's another example from the literature where the outcome of interest isn't death return to work following injury. So the outcome of interest here is returning to work amongst people who actually were out of work because of a work-related injury. The role of economic, social, and job-related factors. And the subjects here were followed, subjects who were out of work because of an injury sustained on the job, they were followed until returning to work or censoring. And the main defendant and the variable in the analysis was measured in days from injury to the first time the study returned to work. And they used Kaplan-Meier estimates of the cumulative proportion of patients returning to work were computed. These estimates, they explain it here a little bit, they take into account how long patients were followed as well as when they returned to work. A log rank test was used to test the association between the cumulative probability of a return to work and each of the risk factors considered one at a time. So one example of a risk factor was the level of impairment. They wanted to see if there were differences in these curves by level of impairment. And what they show here graphically is Kaplan-Meier curves. I'll explain slightly different a formulation in a second by the three different classifications, high impairment, group C, medium impairment, group B, and low impairment, group A. And what they're doing here is they're actually showing the opposite of the way we present it. And this is a way to present it as well. Instead of S of T, S hat of T, the proportion remaining event-free, which would be the proportion remaining out of work in this situation, they present this as 1 minus S hat of T and actually track the proportion who've gone back to work by a given time. 
And we could do this for any of the other examples we looked at just by taking each of our estimates and subtracting them from one. We're getting the complement to the way we did the Kaplan-Meier. So you can see here that there's visual evidence that those who have greater impairment take longer to return to work because the cumulative proportion going back to work in group C is a lot lower in the one-year follow-up period than those in the other two groups. And this, they don't show the p-value in the graph, but this was statistically significantly different as well. So hopefully at the end of this, you have a flavor for how we can summarize this data, how we exploit as much information as we can from those who are censored while still recognizing that they're not a full piece of information. And the fact that this is a multidimensional estimator, something that tracks proportions over the dimension of time. All we've done here is scratch the surface. I wanted to introduce this type of data here while we're discussing data types in this quarter and appropriate methods. And I wanted to introduce some of the difficulties to dealing with this data.